I have been a fan of this woman since she played Opal Gardner on All My Children. Her characterization in that show was outrageous. She then went on to Mama's Family and had a very long career in film and TV. Then she turned to directing and she directed episodes of my beloved show, The Nanny. And then she became a writer and I fell in love with her work. She is now, Dorothy Lyman, presenting a brand new play that she has written and will direct by Zoom, produced by Pat Flicker Addis and Lauren Yarger. It's called The Keys and we are with Dorothy Lyman. Dorothy, where, how did you go from actor to director to writer to director? Well, you know, a woman of my generation has to do everything <laughs> in order to keep working. You know, I, I just um, felt that when there weren't opportunities given me, which I had plenty of, but plenty of downtime, I just had to create projects for myself. And so, um, and I felt there, as I got older, you know, the parts became smaller and less interesting. And instead of being the lead, I was the psychiatrist of the lead or the judge <laughs> sent the lead to jail or, you know, that uh, it wasn't really about me anymore. <laughs> so. I made it my personal mandate to write plays for older guys and gals. So that's how what you, I have done. How did you segue so, from actor to director? You know, but just before you, you go on, I want to say I've been moving out of the farmhouse that I lived in for 19 years, upstate New York. And I actually found the box of Opal Gardner's jewelry. <gasps> Can you imagine in, in my towel closet? And I had so much fun looking at it. And I got my first uh, email or, uh, you know, letter or email from Franny for the first time in years. She reached out to me today. So it's so funny that you would bring up all my children and the nanny and I would have had recent um, blasts from both of those shows. Well, there's How did I become a director? Is that what you said? How did I become a yeah. director? Yeah, how did you become a director? How did it segue from actor to director? Because you were like one of the first women directors on sitcoms. You know, when I was directing, there were nine of us on the Directors Guild list of, of women who directed, you know, three camera studio sitcoms. Now, of course, there are so many more. And uh, a couple of years ago, I played Sarah Jessica Parker. I played her mother on her series. And the woman who was directing that came up to me and said, I know who you are and what you did. And she said, I owe my ability to be a television director to women of your generation. And I was so touched that she, you know, said that. You know, I just was always interested in, in directing. And I hung out a lot in the control rooms. And I got... Um, the director of Mama's Family to teach me how to do it, but they would never give me one to do. That was like a deal breaker every year. And so I, I made a, a little 50 seat theater in a warehouse in Hollywood. And I gave acting lessons to, to pay for the theater and the renovation. And Fran Drescher, who wasn't yet Franny, uh, came to take my acting classes, you know. And she always said, if I ever make it, you know, you're going to come with me. And the thing about Fran is that she is enormously loyal and she keeps her word. So she knew that I was trying to break into TV directing and really was not having very much luck. And I spent five years observing other people. You know, my sister-in-law at the time, Candace Bergen, we were both married to Frenchmen, both past now, but Candy and I were sister-in-laws. And so she got me an observership on Murphy Brown, but just for like one episode. And, you know, I, I just couldn't seem to break in. And so Fran said, if you'll commit to observing for a whole season, I'll see that you get one episode at the end of season two. So I sat there from November till February watching another director direct it all. And I learned and and then that director decided she didn't want to do season three. And so Fran said to me, we're going to let you do next week's episode. So I did next week's episode and it got the biggest laugh spread of any nanny to date. And so they 
offered me the whole third season on the basis of that show and the last three episodes of the second season. So altogether, I did 75 consecutive episodes of the nanny for my dear friend. And, you know, my children owe their college educations to Fran, <laughs> you know, my horses, <laughs> you know, I mean, everything I have is because Franny trusted me and gave me a really, my pension, good Lord, my director's guild pension. You guys want to get in the director's guild. <laughs> you know? So anyway, she's a good, good friend. That's a long I'd like, answer. I, I'd like to bring up a story that I know but I don't, I don't think our readers know. You didn't exactly have an easy time as a director in Hollywood. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, frankly, that's why I became a chicken farmer. <laughs> no, after my three complete, you know, 75 episodes of a hit show on one of the top three networks, I never got another job. And people say, oh, you didn't have the right agent. Hey, I had, I had six different agents, you know, for five years. And I just, you know, the, I think the prevailing opinion was uh, she's an actor, you know, she's a comedian. She's not a director. You know, I didn't come up through the news or the sports, you know, and I wasn't interested in cameras that, that much, you know, I was interested in performance. Although I did learn about the cameras and it's mathematical that's not creative at all it's just technical and i learned that but um but i think my age and my sex you know my son says mother you've got to stop blaming that you know <laughs> but, but i don't um, think it's blaming it it's telling the truth so after five years my my 20-year marriage to vincent mal packed up and my um my youngest child left for college at Santa Cruz and the dog died <laughs> and there I was in this big house in Hollywood that used to be so full of work and people and you know kids and music and there I was all alone with the cat you know <laughs> so that's when I moved upstate New York and became a chicken farmer and that was 20 years ago and I just sold that farm <laughs> and uh um, you know, no, it's been a strange journey, but, but then I began to write since, you know, um, when did I write my first play? I wrote my first play in, um, like, uh, 1995 and my second play in 2015. <laughs> but since then, um, there have been a few others. So there's a tiny body of work now. And, and I must say, Pat Addis and Lauren Yarger are really the first people to have any faith in my writing and I'm really so grateful to them and so happy to be working with them and I hope you know not to disappoint them on Sunday and Tuesday night. <laughs> um, your newest play is called The Keys and your the first play that I saw of yours was about the farmhouse and about needing to move on. What's The Keys about? The Keys is what happens to that farmer's wife from the play you saw when she moves down to that expensive condo in Florida that her daughter, you know, talks about in the first play. I haven't called her by the same name because I want the plays to be able to stand alone, you know, but I started to write the sequel to the farm play with all of the characters from the farm play in it. The, the daughter, the granddaughter, the two husbands, and Gil was like the neighbor on the neighboring balcony. So, and the home health aide, the black gal who was my home health right. aide, you know, and, and I, there was going to be a, an Asian masseuse. And, you know, um, it was going to be about like the old white privileged person giving way to these, to a, a, another generation of people. You know, well, all right. Then COVID hit when I was part way through that play. And I thought, well, nobody's gonna do a six character play set in one room anymore. It's just not possible. And then Pat told me that her friends at New Jersey Rep were looking for plays which could be done on two balconies, two fire escapes. And so suddenly I thought, well, hey, I don't have, it's not set on a fire escape, but it's set on terraces. So, so I wrote this play specifically in the age of COVID about two older people isolated and alone in their balcony, you know, on their opposing balconies, 
um, just trying to deal with the pandemic, you know. And I'm afraid to say that I think this pandemic is going to be with us for quite a while. So, you know, we, we, I know we'd like to rush to get the play on and hope it gets on, but I must say, I think it has a longer shelf life than any of us would wish. Did and you, we'll look back on this time. Did you submit it to New Jersey Rep? No, I did not because Pat and Lauren, you know, um, spoke up. I mean, I, I literally had finished it and Lauren came to lunch and I said to her, I just finished a play. Would you, would you like to hear it? It's short. <laughs> And I think, you know, she said, yes, she would like to hear it. And so I read the play to her on my porch out here. And um, at the end of it, she said, I have never said this before, but I wouldn't change the word. And I really want to produce your play. It's like, you're kidding. <laughs> the ink is hardly dry, <laughs> you know. And so uh, she partnered with Pat. And the two of them have given me the opportunity to read it on Zoom this Sunday and, and then again on Tuesday in hopes that it could be picked up by other theaters. Pat, what made, yeah. you, what made you become a part of this project? Well, I saw Dorothy's first play, or not her first play, but the first play that I saw. The Farmhouse um, play. I thought it was wonderful. And um, Lauren told me about this play. And it's very relevant because um, we all know what COVID has done to people on lockup and older people don't have much more time on their hands. Time is running out and um, people are lonely and people want company. And so it's so relevant and so moving. I mean, Dorothy really knows what it's all about. She really hits the core. And I think that's important. A lot of writers can just do fluff. This is not fluff. You only pick shows that touch your heart. What in this play touched your heart? Well, the relevance of loneliness. I mean, I, I don't happen to be lonely. Um, I must say, I miss New York, but it's not because I'm lonely. Uh, however, I see uh, friends of mine and how people have reacted and I just think this is such an important play because it tells what it is and it gives hope to people who are lonely that there is a soulmate, even at when you're 80 or you're 90, there is still somebody out there that you can connect with if you just dare to open your heart and connect. And I think that's a very important, powerful statement. So um, that's it. <laughs> and. Dorothy's a very gifted writer, and she deserves to have a voice. Um, Bless your heart. I agree. Dorothy, what would you like to write about that you haven't written about yet? I don't really have an answer to that. I don't really know where the, where the plays come from. <laughs> I mean, that sounds strange to say that it's like, um, you know, I was very close with a British playwright called Snoo Wilson, and um, you know, he wrote several plays that I commissioned and, and, you know, John Ford Noonan was the first playwright that I produced, uh, a couple of white chicks sitting around talking in 1980, which became a huge success, his only success, really. And, uh, you know, I always had other writers. I was the director and they were the writers, but Johnny and Snoo died. <laughs> so... I thought, oh no, and Snoo and I had had this idea about two old women who, who, who want to buy tickets to the moon from Elon Musk, and, and I was so sorry that he died before I could get that play from him, and then one night, I was sitting in Mexico, I used to spend the winters down in San Miguel, and suddenly, I sat down and I wrote the 10-minute version of that play, which then became a full-length version, but it was almost like it had been channeled through me by Snoo that night. Um, now, was there some tequila involved? possibly. <laughs> but um, no, so anyway, uh, what do I want to write about? I want to write probably, you know, about death and dying. I mean, <laughs> another cheery topic. No, but I mean about life as I'm seeing it, I guess, or what's the problems facing older folks. And I do want to write the fuller version of the keys. What haven't you accomplished yet that you would like to accomplish? 
You mean besides the Oscar? Anything. <laughs> it, you know what? If it were over tomorrow, and frankly, increasingly it's over for friends of mine, you know, mm. uh, I would be perfectly happy with what I with with what what I've done, you know. Whether it's going to survive, you know. I mean, I'm very gratified that I get 50 pieces of fan mail from people who are probably very disappointed in the eight by ten I send them back <laughs> because it's not Naomi, you know. I had uh, someone come up to me and say, "Weren't you Dorothy Lyman?" <laughs> and I said, "You know, I, I was." And I'm hoping to be again some days. <laughs> you can sing I'm still here. That's right. I'm still here. You know, listen, I love making movies. I would love to be able to shoot this film, this little film. You know, I, I made a film on my farm. I'm so glad I did because I'll always be able to remember that farm the way it was. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's expensive to make movies. It's a lot cheaper to put a play on at, at Shetler, you know. So Shetler's I, gone. I tend to be able to do what, you know, I'm, I'm not, I have no desire to direct television anymore because that is a young person's job. It is so pressured. You have to work so fast and, you know, no. <laughs> I'll leave that to the young and healthy. <laughs> um, no, and I'd like to act more, you know? I'd like to act more. I feel, even though I'm 73, I feel I'm at the peak of my powers as an actor that you just get better with time as an actor. And that when I now feel I have the most to really offer, there's no outlet, you know? There's no desire for it. What would you like audiences to take away from the keys? Some hope, that's all. Just that, you know, even in dark times, there's something to look forward to. Do you know what I mean? That, uh, that optimism is better. <laughs> It's healthier, it's more fun. And, and when can people see the keys? Um, they can watch it on this Sunday at four o'clock or they can watch it on Tuesday, the 27th at seven o'clock. That's Eastern Standard Time. I'd like to add something. Sure. Uh, the keys is a double entendre because although it takes place in the Florida Keys, it's also the keys to your heart, to your apartment. So it's a double entendre. And um, I just wanted to add that. Thank you.